All right, good afternoon, everyone. Not a very big crowd today. <laughs> um, we're going to be starting a new topic, something we haven't talked about yet, called clustering. So the idea behind clustering is this is an unsupervised learning task. We're given a data set of feature vectors, no labels. <clears throat> so just our feature vectors, xi. Our objective is to partition that data set into k groups where the samples are similar with different groups and different across groups. Okay, so this is called, it's called clustering. And so these pictures below show you a couple examples of this. Um, when we say similar, um, <clears throat> And different. There's different ways that you can describe that, but the most common way to think about it is just points that are close together in Euclidean distance are similar. Points that are far away in Euclidean distance are, are different. So here we have an example where um, <clears throat> you can see that all these points in here are close to each other, but then they are far apart from all the other points. Okay, and, uh, and then on the right, we have a more difficult problem. This is the two moons data set. Um, but of course, you could use a, a metric that's different from Euclidean distance, and you could redo this uh, idea of clustering and maybe a more appropriate metric for your problem. So that's the overall idea here. The most kind of famous classical method for clustering is known as k-means. And the idea here is to design uh, what are called centroids. <clears throat> centroids are going to be the centers of the clusters that we're creating. So you can see in this picture down here, um, the, the centroids are indicated by these plus shapes. And you know the data is given by these dots. Now, you can just ignore. For all these things, you probably want to ignore the colors um, in the sense that uh, you know, when we do our clustering, there's no labels on the data. So um, the clustering, of, when we do it, we just, you know, all the points have the same color. Um, <clears throat> but what we're, what we're showing here with, with the colors is, okay, well, let, let me first explain uh, basically what k-means does. <clears throat> so you want to design these centroids. The centroids are these c vectors. And these are supposed to minimize this RSS-based cost. Now, the thing that's different about the cost than we've ever seen before is this term here. So there's a minimization that's after the sum. So the way we interpret this is that <clears throat> we have the sum squared distance where we're summing across all our samples, but we're computing the distance between that sample and the closest cluster to that sample. Okay, so as we move those clusters around, um, you know, for, for a given point x, that would be like this dot, uh, for this arrangement of the clusters, that are centroids, this is the closest centroid. But if I move my centroids around a little bit, you know, maybe I move the centroids over here, then all of a sudden the closest distance, this closest uh, centroid from, the, from this guy would be over here. So, so this is sort of an interesting metric and it makes it uh, something that's challenging to optimize. Um, as far as I know, there's no known algorithm that uh, exactly solves this problem, but there are some uh, nice approximate algorithms algorithms that approximately solve it, which we'll talk about next. But uh, yeah, just to say it in words, the cost is a sum square distance from each sample to the closest centroid. That's what we're doing here. Um, and once we solve or approximately solve this problem and we know what our centroids are, then we are in a position of clustering each one of our data points is essentially saying which centroid is it closest to. 
So let's say we've discovered that we want to use these five centroids, and then we go through all of our data samples XI, and we just say, for this data sample, which is the closest centroid? For this data sample, which is the closest centroid? And at that point, we're giving each data sample a cluster label. So then we're doing the clustering. Then we're assigning these colors. Another way to think about the decision process is through decision regions. And the decision regions are here are illustrated by these lines. And you can see these are uh, what they call Voronoi cells. So there's a nice geometry. And if you, know, if you give me a new, a new point over here, um, if, I, if I knew the regions, I wouldn't have to necessarily search over all my clusters. I would just immediately see, oh, that's in this region, this is in this other region, and so on. Okay. So that's, that's basically um, the objective of k-means clustering, and once you find your centroids, this is how you can apply them to do the clustering. Any questions on anything here? Okay, so now, how do we attack this problem? So the most famous approach is called Lloyd's algorithm. It's a very simple, uh, basically iterative algorithm that just repeats these two steps. So <clears throat> you start with some usually random initialization of the centroids. Then you iterate the two steps on the left. <clears throat> um, for each centroid k, centroid index k, you compute the sample mean of the data within the kth Voronoi cell, and then you set the new centroid at that sample mean. So let's take a look in this picture. So here, we start here, this is our data, and this is, let's say we just randomly initialize with those two centroids. We have a red centroid and a blue centroid. First step, compute the sample mean of the data within the kth Voronoi cell. So with these two centroids, the decision region would just be split by this line that bisects them. So this would be one cell, this is the other cell. And so we just want to compute the, the sample mean of the data. So here we again see the decision region. Now we can see these blue points are all the ones in that cell. So we compute their sample mean, which turns out to be right here. And then we compute the sample mean of all these red points, which turns out to be here. So now we have these, um, have our new centroids. And now I compute the new Voronoi regions, as shown over here. And I compute the sample mean of these points, which is this x, and the sample mean of those points which is this x, and we just repeat this. And as you can see, um, as we repeat it, we get better and better clustering, and eventually we get to the point where um, nothing changes. So as we went from this step to this step, none of the points, or, or maybe, okay, I think here, here we can see one of, this, one of the points change color. But after this point, you would find that none of the points are changing colors, and you would terminate the algorithm. Okay, and then this is the final clustering. Okay, so there's a nice simple technique. I think it's, it's been around, I think maybe since the 50s, a long time. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that this can get stuck in a local minimum of the cost, so it's not guaranteed to solve the cost, minimize the cost. Um, <clears throat> the main improvement that people have, been, have made to this is through a careful initialization, initialization that's not totally random. So um, <clears throat> you do something like initialize the first point randomly, and then to initialize the second point, or the second centroid, you look at the data as well as that first initialization. The most famous technique is known as k-means plus plus. It still doesn't optimally minimize the um, k-means cost, but it works a lot more robustly. Um, and in fact, when you look at the scikit-learn implementation of k-means, it uses that plus-plus initialization by default. <clears throat> okay. So we won't get into a lot of the details behind, you know, what exactly, the, how exactly the initial, what initialization works, but it's, um, it's the main way that people run this. All right. 
any questions so far? All right. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears and talk about um, text mining. Basically, we're, we're gonna apply some of these techniques to text data. It's the kind of data we've never seen before in the course, so we need to talk a little bit about how, how do you actually represent documents, text documents, um, in a way that we can do machine learning with them. Um, and so the, the problem that's motivating us as we consider this is document clustering. So the idea would be, imagine that somebody gives you like a whole bunch of documents. Maybe, you know, some are, are um, stories about sports. Maybe some are stories about science and so on. And you don't know, the computer doesn't know, um, you have no labels on them. But the objective is to somehow cluster them put them into groups where you have similarities within a group, differences across groups. So you get something like this. <clears throat> okay, so um, the data set we're gonna use is a uh, you know, relatively small, friendly data set that consists of um, news group articles uh, from the 90s, mainly. And this is sort of the very early days of the internet and even pre-internet where there would be these message boards that people would post questions on and, and have discussions on. These documents are relatively short and simple, and there are ground truth category labels in that when someone would post a message, they would be posting it to some particular, um, <clears throat> I'll show you here, some particular uh, category. So in this 20 news groups data set, there are, um, articles from 20 different Usenet categories shown here, and there's about a thousand documents per category. So for the categories, you can see that there's a bunch of computer-based categories for sale, um, some recreation categories, there's some science categories, uh, politics, and religious categories. So, um, so, you know, we, we do have labels. You could say for, for all these different documents, we know which category is coming from. And we can use those labels as a way of determining whether our clustering is working out well or not. It just gives us sort of a, a reference point. But of course, when we cluster, we don't have any labels. We just have a bunch of documents we want to organize it. <clears throat> okay, so you can uh, get this data set in scikit-learn. We're just gonna load only four categories, um, alt atheism, computer graphics, science space, and talk, religion, miscellaneous. And this is gonna give us uh, 3387 samples total, so that's how many documents we have. Um, <clears throat> when we load the data, we get an array of strings each, um, yeah, each element in the array is a, is a Usenet post. Here is an example of a Usenet post on the bottom. This was from the computer graphics um, <coughs> uh, set, and you can see here it's, it's someone that's looking for help with a particular graphics card. <coughs> so this would be a string that is one entry in this array. Associated with this string is a label. The label tells us that it came from this uh, computer graphics um, uh, news group. Of course, when we cluster, we don't know those labels. Our objective is to, you could almost say, like, discover those labels. And, um, and then we have, we have the names of the different categories. So we actually just have, like, we know that the first group is this, the second group is this, and so on. So that's what we get, and um, okay, so yeah. So that's, that's, that's our data set. <clears throat> so the next thing to talk about is this so-called bag of words model, which is a simple model, but it's sort of the standard model that people use to represent text documents. So it goes like this, um, and, and in this simple illustrative example, we have only two documents, and the two documents are these, 
the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog's back and you know blah 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 so the way that the bag of works model is uh, works is first of all you list all the words also called terms in all the documents so here you can see that we have looked at we're, we're listing all the terms from both documents we're omitting common words like the and so on these are called stop words so even though you you see them in the documents you don't have them in our term list and then you represent this is kind of the key part you represent each document as an array of word counts okay so for example document one would be this string of binary numbers <clears throat> And it, it tells you that in document one, the word aid never showed up, all never showed up, back showed up once, brown showed up once, and so on. In this particular case, the words, the terms are only showing up once, but in general, you, know, you, could, you could have cases where these are just uh, non-negative integers. Here's the stop word list, the ones we're not including. <clears throat> okay, so one of the first things you notice immediately is that you have lost, in this representation, you have no sense for how the words were ordered originally. You've thrown that out completely. So, um, so this kind of representation is not gonna give you, you know, the full meaning of the document because obviously if I show you words, if I give you a sentence and I randomly mix the words in the sentence, you usually cannot figure out what the sentence was saying originally. However, this may be enough for us to cluster the documents, to categorize the documents. And for example, in this case, we might notice that, you know, one document is talking about animals and another document is, you know, talking about other stuff. So that's, that's what we can hope to get from this representation. Okay, so any questions on that? That's the bag of words model. So the main issues that you, if, if all you did was this, the main issues you would encounter are that some documents are much longer than others, which can give you, you know, weird effects in the representation. And second, some terms are much more common than others. So for example, if there's a term that we find in almost all our documents, we really shouldn't put much weight on that term because it's not gonna be very useful to distinguish different, um, different topics, right? But if there's words that are, um, they come up, you know, only once in a while, they could be very helpful in, in, um, in clustering, determining what, what a given, what, whether a given uh, set of doc, su subset of documents comes from a particular cluster. So that's what we wanna do, is we wanna uh, get around these issues. And to get around these issues, um, <clears throat> there's basically, couple ideas we could use. So rather than just listing how many times term J occurs in document I, which is essentially like these columns, you normalize it by the number of terms in that document. So here you can see because you have, as the document grows, uh, or let's say, yeah, as, as the size of the document grows, no, more and more words, both the numerator and denominator would grow similarly. And so this guy here is more or less invariant to document size. So this is called term frequency instead of like term counts. The second idea um, to deal with uncommon terms or to deal with you know, terms that are common or more common, less common, you use this thing called the inverse document frequency. So if you look at what's happening here, you have the number of documents with term J in your total corpus divided by the number of documents in the corpus. And so <clears throat> this is gonna, um, and then it helps to work in the log domain. And then there's also this minus sign. So this minus sign, if you think about what would happen if you'd move that through the log, that would invert this, right? So that's why this is the inverse document frequency. So this is the document frequency and then we get the inverse from there. So this is going to emphasize uncommon terms and say these are more important uh, for our features. So finally, from these two building blocks, 
the term frequency and the inverse document frequency, you simply construct your features this way. So this is the feature matrix that we're, we usually see. So as always, as you go down the, um, the rows, we have the different samples, which are for us the documents. And as you go across the columns, you have J, which are our terms. So um, the number of features for us is the number of terms. The number of samples is the number of documents. So this just shows us how to construct the ith row and jth column of our feature matrix. And even though this is relatively simple, a uh, relatively simple approach, it's very popular. It was used by 83% of text recommender systems as of 2015. So very ubiquitous. Um, one thing to note is that in a lot of the literature, they actually transpose the x relative to what we've done. We're just writing it this way so we can be consistent with all of our earlier lectures where we're always indexing features across columns and samples across rows. Okay, so if you look at the transpose version, you can think of that as the term document matrix because term terms um, J would go this way and documents I would go this way. Okay, so that's, we'll just call, we'll call X in general the term document matrix. Okay, so um, now there's a few really important things to note about this uh, this matrix. So again, X, I, J is the score of document I in term J. So for example, um, let's say you want to do document retrieval. So the goal is to find which documents are most associated with a given term or terms. This is exactly what you do when you type something into Google, right? Google has like this whole internet of documents out there you type in a term and you want it to find the documents that are most associated with your terms. So that's exactly what this is. A very simple approach to this is you take all your documents, you build this TF-IDF matrix X, and now you know that the jth column corresponds to the jth word. So if someone types in jth word, you extract the kth column of this matrix and you look at all the scores. The, the entry with the highest score is gonna be the document that's most associated with that word. So you just, you just report to the user, here's a listing of you know, most relevant documents, second most relevant, basically just like Google does, right? So that's, this is, of course, Google does more than this, but you know, this is like the simplest possible search engine you could think of. <clears throat> um, there's, another, there's other things you can do with this document matrix. Let's say you want to find, this is called document retrieval, semantic analysis. You might want to find the relationships among terms. So um, imagine that you, uh, you discover some ancient language. Uh, you have all, you know, all these examples of, of, of uh, sentences or documents from the language. You don't really know what it means. You're trying to figure out what does this word mean? What does this word mean? You might try to figure out how words relate to each other, which are synonyms, which are antonyms, and so on. You can do this by extracting the... Um, <clears throat> You know, the jth uh, column with, from word j, another column from word j prime, and you just do the inner product to measure their similarity. So that the larger the inner product, the more similar those words seem to be. They occur together in documents versus not together in documents. So these are just really simple things that we can do with the term document matrix. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use it for clustering. Um, Okay, but this is, this is where we're going to get to some really important properties of this matrix. The first thing to note is that in practice, this thing can be huge. Um, if we just look at our simple demo, which is a toy problem, um, if you remember our demo, we had 3,300, 3,400 different documents. Um, it, was, what was, it was like 33... 87 or something in the demo. So even from those 3,300, the number of terms when you take out the stop words is 38,000. So it's already pretty big matrix, right? Um, so fortunately, this matrix is very sparse. By sparse, we mean most elements equal zero. Another word to say, another way to say that in this application is that 
most documents use only a small fraction of the total vocabulary. So if you look at any given row, that's to say most entries are zero, a few entries are non-zero. And <clears throat> knowing that it's sparse, we can actually store it in the computer in a very different way. So, um, so you know, in, a, in, a, in a, ma a language like MATLAB or languages that can handle sparse matrices, um, the way that you represent the matrix is you have a list of the non-zero entries in the matrix, a list of where they occur, and then you have, you know, let's say a floating point value for each of those entries. Whereas for a regular matrix, you have a floating point value for all of the entries in the matrix, and even if an entry is zero, you still represent it with full floating point precision. So sparse matrix, you're exploiting the fact that you know there's tons of zeros, and so you can get away with just coding it as, basically just, just coding only the non-zero ones. Um, of course, when you start to do things like matrix multiplies, it's much more complicated with sparse matrices. You have to specifically look through the indices and figure out which ones you want to multiply. And so the, the linear algebra starts to slow down quite a bit. Um, but you know, still, in some cases, maybe the only way to represent this thing is as a sparse matrix. Maybe it's impossible to even store if it's a non-sparse matrix. OK, so that's, that's one thing. Um, another thing about x is that it often has low rank. Uh, another way to say that it has few non-zero, uh, I said eigenvalues, but actually this should say singular values because in general x is not going to be square, but we can always take an SVD. <clears throat> and as we'll see, we can try to exploit this for document clustering. Um, essentially, we can try to apply PCA to the, to the clustering problem. And another important thing is that all the terms in our uh, TF-IDF matrix are non-negative. And we can also exploit this for document clustering, and we'll do so with uh, an approach called non-negative matrix factorization. Okay, so these are kind of the, the ingredients that we're going to use. Um, but the very first thing we can do is we can try k-means. We can just run k-means on the term document matrix to do clustering. <clears throat> OK, so how do we get this term document matrix in Python? It's really easy in sklearn. You just use this tf-idf vectorizer. Um, you tell it which stop words to use, which is essentially we just want to use the standard stop words from English. And then you can see we just give it the data set. And vectorizer fit transform um, generates our x matrix. And when we look at the shape of x, you see we have this many samples, this many features. So that's, those are the numbers we were talking about before. OK, so, um, so let's, let's take a little closer look at um, the terms in the TF-IDF score. So let's just take an example document. This is actually the same document we saw before where someone was looking for help with a graphics card. And um, so that's going to be one row of our, of our matrix. So uh, actually, let me see. In this case, the matrix is going to be wide, right? We have like 3, 3, 87 by, what was it, 3, 3, or 3, 8, 7, 7, 7. OK. And so what we're doing now is we're just taking out one row, which corresponds to one document. And we're, we're sorting the. Um, sorting the scores in there. And you can see there's only 21 of them that are non-zero. All the rest are zero. So it's extremely sparse. 20 non-zeros out of 38 or 39,000. And for this document, you can see the scores. So this word POV has the highest score. It's probably a very unique term that was used. You know, maybe it was only used in this one document, but it it, it was thought of as being very special. And then you have terms like true, which are probably used in many different uh, documents, and so they get less weight. OK. All right. Um, so we can now run k-means on, uh, on our matrix. So this is, this is pretty straightforward. Um, we have the k-means um, from scikit-learn cluster. 
So with k-means, one thing is you do have to specify how many clusters to use. For this application, we know that we want to use four clusters because we have four news groups. You can specify which initialization to use. This is used by default, but just did this to show it, k-means plus plus. Tell it how many iterations to use. This is probably more than it needs, but um, it, it will stop at 100 if not before. And also with k-means, you can ask that it is run several times from several different random initializations, and then what it will do is it will look for the one that gave you this lowest cost for k-means and report that. We're just going to do one um, initialization in this case. And it shows you as the iterations go. Uh, I don't know exactly what the inertia is. It might be the k-means cost itself. But as you can see, something is decreasing until the point where essentially it stopped decreasing. Um, and, you know, basically did, did some sort of clustering. So, all right, and then we can take a look at the results of that clustering. So, again, let's, let's remember what we're doing. We're, we're asking k-means to compute four centroids. A centroid, in this case, is going to be a 38777 length vector of TF, IDF scores. And each score corresponds to a particular term, a particular word in our dictionary. So <clears throat> what we can do is we, we, can, we can go through and um, we're going to print the terms or the words with the top, the 10 top scores in each centroid. So here's centroid zero. We see that it's, these, are, these are the top terms, God, Jesus, people, objective, Sandvik, Don, belief, moral, say, morality. So, yeah, it seems like these are all similar. I mean, they, they seem to be kind of clustered. They're about religion, morality, ethics, things like that. Um, cluster one, look at the terms there. EDU, rights, article, com, just think, people, don't, like, no. I don't know. I don't, you know, see much clustering going on there. Uh, next one, graphics, thinks, image, file, files, program, format, images. That sounds like a computer graphics. And then the last one, space, NASA, shuttle, launch, orbit, moon, edu, rights, gov, just. So that one also looks to be pretty clustered. If you remember, these are the true categories that uh, we know uh, that the documents came from. Of course, k-means did not know about these, but we know this. And, and yes, we can see... Um, Alt atheism and talk religion misc could explain the first one. Computer graphics could explain cluster two, psi space, cluster three. Cluster one, maybe not such a great clustering. <clears throat> so we can actually be a little bit more specific about this. We can compute a confusion matrix, a normalized one, similar to what we did in classification. And so we're going to compute it such that the it's going to be a four by four matrix uh, where the rows are indexed by L, the columns by K, and the rows will go over the news groups. Um, the, the, these are the true news groups and the columns over the clusters. Okay, okay news groups and clusters. And so now, <clears throat> and they're normalized. It's normalized so that each column sums to one. So that means for each cluster, we can see the proportion across the true news groups. So when we look at the first cluster, we see that almost all the samples are either in the first uh, one, which is alt atheism, or the last one, which is that talk, talk religion misc. So it's doing a good job. Um, you could argue that maybe it's impossible almost impossible to split those because they probably have extremely similar terms. Okay, the next one, as we expected, it's not really doing a good job of clustering at all. The third one, almost, you know, a lot of the samples are in that second category, which is computer graphics, that looks good. And the third one, almost all are in the third one, which is talk, religion, myths. Oh, sorry, size space, size space. So, so basically, these are doing well, but this, uh, this other one here, not well. <clears throat> All right. 
Any questions so far? Okay, so let's take a look at a clustering error. So what we can do is we can, we can say, okay, this is working pretty well, but like where, let's see, where, where, what, what do these errors look like? So let's print out one of them. This is a post that was in alt atheism, but it was uh, clustered along with the other um, computer graphics posts. And when you look through here, you see that it talks about color red, color red, red, red. And you can see, okay, it makes sense that this was um, clustered or grouped together with the computer graphics. Even though, yes, if you look at the actual meaning of what they're talking about, it's not computer graphics. But based on the words alone, it's uh, not surprising that it was clustered together with computer graphics. <clears throat> so maybe a more sophisticated uh, algorithm, you know, a human could have done better than this, but um, that's what happened with k-means. So, um, <clears throat> all right, so that, that concludes what we're, our discussion of k-means and gives us um, a problem to work on that we can apply some other methods to. Any questions about k-means? All right. All right, so let's, let's talk about some other methods where we're gonna do um, clustering or you could say topic modeling via low rank matrix factorization. So um, the main idea here is we wanna take, this is our TF IDF uh, our feature matrix. So we have documents along this axis terms along this axis, and we're going to approximate it in this way. And as you can see, the way it was written, it's just basically showing you singular value decomposition. This is going to be diagonal matrix. This is going to be a matrix with orthogonal columns, and this is a matrix with orthogonal rows. So um, in other words, you can say that we are approximating x by this matrix, and this matrix gives us for any rank R, so R is now this width, for, for given a rank R of all possible ways to split it apart like this, the SVD gives us the one that matches X best according to um, RSS. That's what we learned in the last chapter. But there's another approach we can use called, this is PCA, or or we could say SVD, um, called non-negative matrix factorization. And it exploits the fact that this is non-negative. PCA does not exploit that fact. And in fact, it gives us um, an approximation where if you, if you multiply this out, there is a chance that you could get negative values. In fact, I'm almost positive you would. Um, and as we know, that, that wouldn't really make sense with, um, with our TF-IDF scores. In non-negative matrix factorization, we do a similar low rank factorization like this, where we, we declare what the rank will be, but we make sure that both W and H are both non-negative. So that's what the little pluses mean here, both non-negative. <coughs> And the way that it works in particular is that this NMF minimizes RSS under the constraint of non-negative factor matrices. Okay, so this, um, this is basically the approach. So coming back to the, to the, first, the first one, um, this is known when we do PCA with term document matrices, it has the specific name of latent semantic analysis. Okay, so this is PCA on term document matrices. And we can now interpret this as follows. So this matrix tells us essentially the relationship between topics and documents. And this matrix tells us the relationship between terms and topics, because topics is on this axis. And this is, you could say, some sort of weighting 
weighting matrix that um, says how the different topics are weighted overall within this. Okay, so just by splitting it into things of this shape, you can kind of see what it's trying to do. It's trying to link topics to documents or topics to terms. Um, basically, but the, the math is, is all exactly um, SVD and PCA. So as we talked about last time, for any matrix X, and in this case, R denotes the rank of X, you can write it as UR, SR, VR. These were the, um, this is the economy SVD. And you can also write this as a sum if you want, where you take the kth column here, the kth diagonal entry here, and the kth row here. Um, now when we do PCA, we choose a capital R that's less than the rank, the true rank, and we do an approximation of X by a, another SVD where these guys are skinnier than the, than the, exact, the, the exact decomposition. And so in doing that, we get an error. But you know, for a given R, we choose these matrices in a way that minimizes the RSS between the approximation and the true X. So application of PCA from last time, and as I just described in the previous slide, when you look at what these matrices mean, you can think of the U's as what they call principal document vectors, the V's as principal term vectors, and then these S's are weights. <clears throat> okay, so the main thing about this that is um, problematic are that the values in UR and VR can be negative. Um, also, UR, S, R, VR transpose can be negative. And there's no good interpretation for these negative values because you know, we're, we're thinking about the frequency of terms, what do we mean by these negative frequencies? <clears throat> okay, so let's see how this works on 20 news groups. So we apply this on 20 news groups and we look at the principal um, components here. So this would be, um, you could say, one cluster, or one, one topic, we're showing the terms most associated with that topic. And when you look at these, you see there's actually no correspondence between those terms at all. Um, and when you look at the um, confusion matrix, you can see everything is spread out. So basically clustering, this clustering method completely failed in this data set. So maybe it works on some other data sets, but at least on this one, it did not work. All right, what about non-negative matrix factorization? So here, we take our matrix and we split it into a matrix here that tells us the relationship between documents and topics, another one between topics and terms. And so when you think about, uh, and, and of course we said importantly that W and H are both gonna be um, non-negative matrices. So because we put an additional constraint on what those matrices must be, we're not gonna have as good of a fit in RSS to X, but maybe that's not so important. Uh, maybe, maybe fitting X in RSS is not really the goal uh, when we do um, clustering. You know, similar to how we saw in, in the last unit that it's not necessarily what's gonna help us with classification. Okay, the nice thing here is that these are all non-negative, and so we can, we can actually interpret this. When we see a large value in this matrix, we know that uh, that particular document is, um, has a high correspondence with that topic being used. When we look over here and we see a large element, that means that that, that topic and that term uh, have a strong uh, weight. And if you see a zero somewhere, you, mean, you know that you know, that topic and that document 
Um, probably that document is not associated with that topic. Okay. So let's apply non-negative matrix factorization to our data set. And here are the, the results we get. The first cluster, God, Jesus, people, believe, Bible, Christian, looks really good. The second one, graphics, image, thanks, file, files, format, looks really good. Third one, space, NASA, EDU, shuttle, orbit, that looks good. And the last one, objective, morality, moral, and so on, that looks good too. If we uh, compute the confusion matrix, we see that the first cluster, uh, like with k-means, it's more or less evenly split between alt-atheism and talk religion misc. The second one, unlike k-means, is well clustered as computer graphics. The third one is pretty well clustered as psi space. And this last one is split between alt-atheism and talk religion misc again. And that's not unreasonable because we said it's probably really difficult to split those apart, especially when we have a bag words representation and we have lost the meaning of the sentences by shuffling the terms around or actually not, not using the, the location within the sentence. So this looks actually like a, a I would say, overall better result than k-means. k-means had one cluster that was sort of nonsense. Okay. Um, and this causes us to think a little bit more about, you know, what we're doing here. Um, Non-negative non matrix factorization versus LSA or PCA, um, they're, they're similar in that they're both low rank factorizations, but they're different in that, um, you know, NMF uses a non-negative sum of non-negative components. And so there's something that's uh, kind of a f fundamental idea here that NMF gives us what we call a parts-based representation, um, whereas PCA is all about splitting into orthonormal components. We don't have orthonormality with NMF, but maybe that's not important. We have positivity. So here's an example where um, <clears throat> we took, let's see, I have to think about uh, what's going on here. Okay, we took a... Um, face database, and we, um, we partition this database into, um, similar to this, this stuff. Um, so in this, in this it's, it's like the face application we saw in the last unit. Each row would be a rasterized face, and then we did this decomposition, but now non-negative. So we have a dictionary matrix and then for each face, like if we're talking about, or actually, let's, let's see. So this is actually the dictionary matrix. And if I want to reconstruct the first face, I would take this times this. And that would give me an approximation of this face. So this is the stuff that's common to all the faces. And then this gives me, um, tells me exactly how to reconstruct this sample in the data set. So, so here is, these are the building blocks, the dictionary, and then this tells me how to combine them to approximate this original face. So this is one sample in my database. This is the approximation that I get with non-negative matrix factorization. And essentially what we're doing is each one of these is a face of the same size as this, and these are just scalars. So it's like this scalar multiplied by this, plus this scalar multiplied by this, and so on, eventually gives you this. On the other hand, when we think about PCA, <clears throat> here we have the mean vector uh, that we, we subtract out of our data set. And these are our principal, vector, principal components. So we saw those, those are what we call the eigenfaces. And then to reconstruct or approximate this original face, these are the scalars that I would use. This is, um, we would you know, take this times this plus this times this and so on. And the first thing we notice is that um, there's negative and positive values. The red ones are 
negative and the black pixels here are positive. So not only do the eigen uh, faces have positive and negative values, but the combining coefficients, they're also negative and positive. In the end, the approximation we get may be better than the original. However, as you can see, it's perhaps less interpretable. When we look at these, um, well, it's just a different way of breaking things up. You know, as, as we know, all of these guys are orthogonal to each other. That's interesting, maybe that's useful. But something very interesting is going on in this parts-based representation. Here you can, you can really see like it's, it's building the image from little particular features. Like this would be the shadow under the nose. Here we have what look like shadows associated with the eyes or the eyebrows. Um, here is a shadow maybe associated with the mouth or the chin. Um, here's like a shadow to the right side of the nose. And so it's, it's just really interesting to see how NMF deconstructs faces into these parts of the faces, whereas PCA you know, deconstructs it in a very different way. All right. Any questions on, on this? All right, just a couple more slides then. Uh, yeah, a couple more slides. So let's do again some compare and contrast between these two methods. Um, so again, both of them are both of them are low rank approximations. NMF designed for non-negative x, while well, PCA you can apply it to any x. So that's another thing. If you if you have x that has negative values, you cannot use NMF. Okay, um, NMF gives you non-negative factors, whereas PCA can give you factors with negative entries. NMF gives you non-orthogonal factors, whereas PCA gives you orthogonal factors. Um, NMF turns out to encourage sparse factors, as we saw here. There's a lot of sparsity in these, and also this one. Whereas uh, PCA will give you dense factors. NMF is non-unique, while PCA is unique. And NMF solvers can get stuck in low local minima, while PCA solvers don't. They just give you the exact answer. OK, so, um, so just few high-level things on the difference. And the very last slide for today is um, there's other uh, neat applications of non-negative matrix factorization. So one important one is called recommender systems, which is used heavily in advertising and things like that. So, you know, companies like Amazon, they want to know which products to advertise to which users. They want to know um, <coughs> Yeah, what's, what's the relationship between products and users? And a very um, common way or kind of classical way to do this is known as collaborative filtering. So what you do is you build a big matrix that along one dimension you have all the products you sell, along the other dimension you have all the users in your database. Now the thing is, every user has only uh, provided feedback or maybe bought a small subset of products, right? So you only know a few um, entries in this matrix. You wish that you knew the entire matrix because then you could look up immediately and say, what is this user's favorite product? Or for this product, which are the users I should be advertising it to? So you wish you knew the full complete matrix, but you have data only for a few entries. So this is, this is known as matrix completion. Matrix completion also occurs, it's a problem that occurs in other, other, other uh, tasks beyond collaborative filtering, but it's sort of a famous one, a famous one is collaborative filtering. And so this is a, a place that we can apply non-negative matrix factorization to, and we would do it like this. So here's the matrix X. We only know a few values. Uh, I, J, and we're, those are, we're going to do the sum over those few values. But we are going to design these full non-negative matrices. And here you can see we have like RSS on the known values. But we are constructing full matrix, matrices W and H. And when we're done, we have this approximation here. And if I want to look up, you know, one entry in this table, 
I can just compute that and, and look that up. So a famous example of this is the Netflix contest, which ran uh, maybe 10-ish years ago. Uh, Netflix gave a million dollars to the winner. So in their application, they had 18,000 movies, they had 480,000 users, um, but they did not have you know, every user rating every movie. So they had a subset of about 1.2%, 100 million ratings, which was about 1.2% of the total. And they put this out and they said, um, you know, find me the algorithm that performs the best in our data. We'll give a million dollars to the winner. <clears throat> And so I think the, the very winning method was not based on non-negative matrix factorization, um, but um, I think most of the methods, most of the high scoring methods were. They were various tweaks of, of this. So this is a really uh, solid um, technique for a lot of these sorts of problems. All right, so that's... That's all we'll talk about. And then next time we'll talk about, we'll switch gears and talk about uh, Gaussian mixture models and expectation maximization. All right. Thanks for coming today. See you guys next week. Have a nice weekend.